Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. I am going to be talking to the rather wonderful Mr. Billy Decker, so stick around. Mr. Billy Decker, how are you? I'm great, Mr. Hewitt. How are you, sir? <laughs> I am good. I'm good. I see you're sitting in your rather lovely studio. In Nashville, Tennessee, we're at the cabin at Westwood. So, mm -hmm. And it's an actual log cabin. There's a tracking room up in the front. And I've got the back area with the rocking chair front porch and all that. And it's just a mix room, purely a mix room. I have an overdub booth in the back and a machine room and a lounge. But yeah, it's just mix, 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 five days a week. Fantastic. Well, before we get stuck in, and what, what exactly have you got on there? What are those, what are those speakers? What do you use? I don't recognize I have uh, Mackie 824s, the Mark IIs, but they are wow. they are paired with uh, a Quested 18-inch subwoofer from like 1996. And I brought it with me from Soundstage and I can't live without it. I've got it set barely so it's on, but it's just enough to vibrate the desk and I lean forward and I actually feel it rumble my chest like that. And that's how I judge my low end. So if you ever see me leaning up in like a video, it's because I'm pushing against the, the armrest and trying to feel the vibration. And I know the bass is right on. The middle speakers are called Wathen Audios and they were made down in Texas. Don Thomas created those and they've got a tube power amp and everything. They remind me of old Tannoys, the kind of spongy, really fun to listen to, you know? where a snare drum is just, there's not much attack. It's just all top and all. It sounds like everything that you listen to through those sounds like Def Leppard. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a huge gated reverb on everything. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. So look, I've got to stop you then. So so were the Mackies, how did you get into Mackies? Were they songs that you grew up using and they just stuck? They... Uh, I had them at the first demo studio I ever started mixing demos at, and I got used to them. I migrated over to a studio called Soundstage and was in front of a, like a 56 channel Pro Control, big Pro Tools rig, and the studio manager came to me after I started really doing pretty good for the studio and brought them a lot of business, and he said, we'll buy you anything you want. So at the time, Chuck Ainley was over there in the back room, and Chuck said, try these speakers. And they were like made out of metal and he had concrete speaker, poured con. I mean, Chuck's like high end everything. I tried everything on the planet, you know? And I always kept coming back to these Mackies. I just could not wrap my head around anything other than those. So I politely went to the front, talked to the studio manager. I said, hey, I know this is gonna break your heart, but I just saved you tens of thousands of dollars. I don't need anything. I'm good with what I got. Let's just, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So fast forward to today, I upgraded to the Mackie Mark IIs. The original Mackies to me were 2D. These are 3D. So I can hear reverbs. I can hear a little depth with them. Uh, I tuned my room myself and I've got I wired it myself, so everything's probably out of phase and buzzy and all that stuff. <laughs> but you know what? Nobody knows the difference. You fake it till you make it, right? So essentially, the previous model and these ones have very similar similar characteristics, so you didn't really have to... They just, like you're saying, got an extra dimension to them. Correct. That's the way I perceive them. Yeah, 2D versus 3D. But the low end is the same. The high end is the same. I actually run them so that the high end shoots just over my head, like right about here. And my desk, I've got an Argosy console and I've fallen in love with this through the years where if I sit in front of a, like our good friend Reed Shippen or Chuck Ainley or whoever, you know, sits in front of an SSL, it's too deep for me. So I'm actually used to sitting closer to the speakers and I just, I could never wrap my head around it. And I would always blow my ears out sitting behind a bigger console like that because I had to turn it up for some reason, that extra foot and a half or whatnot, you know? I also have another fun fact. I keep the studio really cold. Now, now bear with me. I'm not like a conspiracy theorist or anything like that, but is it true 
According to physics, sound travels through dense air, colder air, slower, rather than if it's hot, the molecules are farther apart, it goes through faster. By me keeping my studio colder, I'm slowing down the, the sound so that I can hear it better. It's, it's... <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you. Your results are great. You know, I mean, that might be true. I mean, I'm sure there's people down below. I actually thought about that one time and I'm like, there's a reason I don't mix good in a hot room. It's the weirdest thing. I always keep it cold. Otherwise, it just doesn't sound as good. And I, and I stopped and thought about it. And not only am I like dripping sweat and miserable and stuff, but I'm like, I think the audio moves slower. I don't know if that's true or false. I'm probably going to get called out in every audio blog all over the world. Well, you, if, if people did call you out, that'd be silly because you're not actually saying it as a fact. You're just saying you think it might be. I, I am really, I've got two instances with this. I have this old console down here and it has like these four lights on it which used to be attached to a studio. So one was the record ready, one was the record light. And of course... And they're not attached to anything anymore. But we did an album and one of the lights, the blue light, was on years and years and years ago. And when I was working again with that same producer, I engineered the record, I said to him, I said, last time we had a hit album, that blue light was on. <laughs> He's like, turn it on. Even though we know there's no audio going through the light bulb whatsoever. It's just a psychological thing, isn't it? So you might be right. But it doesn't really matter. If you think you're right, that's that's all that matters. I mean, you think it affects it. I probably am. I've only been wrong twice in my life. Today ain't number three, Warren. Today ain't number three, <laughs> Betty. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. So you have the Argosy. And yes. what, what's going on there? What, what have you got going on in the back there? Uh, I've got a Pro Control. I've got the speakers. Uh, I've got a X-Logic SSL. Uh channel strip in case somebody does need to sing an overdub or whatnot. I have an overdub booth. Um, and then I have my TV, which I always have on. And I always tell this story. I tried to work it into the video, but something happened. We didn't, we didn't grab it. If I know, I never talk politics, religion, anything like that, you know, on social media in the studio, because yeah, it, it's just the, it's the best way to never get called again. You know, you cannot win. <laughs> So I tell everybody, if I know you're right-leaning politically, I'll put on Fox News, a, a conservative channel. If I know you lean left, coming into the studio, I'll put it on MSNBC. If I don't know what you are, I put it on the tennis channel and we all get along. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't love Roger Federer? Come on. We don't have a TV in here. We've, we've threatened that many times. And Eric, who... Uh, who you've chatted with, he's a big LA sports fan. So if we had a TV back there, it'd be Dodgers. And then what's the hockey team? Kings. The Kings. Lakers. The Lakers. It would just be like 24-hour oh, yeah. like a day. That's awesome. You know, I think a bit of that is okay, especially with the hours we work. You know, sometimes you're in the studio for so many hours. Yeah, and if you... I mean, you're just sitting in front of your speaker listening to music. Uh, the world could be burning outside and you have no idea. There's a tornado coming, you know? We actually had a tornado here and my neighbor up front in the tracking room, Nick Rescue Linux, he's a big rock producer. I had to go up and bang on the door and go, guys, we got this windstorm coming in 10 seconds. And the entire band came out. He unlocked the door. We all went down in the basement stuff and the tornado sirens went off, but they didn't have TVs up on there because they were actually recording. So he had a whole band and here I am just mixing. I got like one of the news channels and weather channel and it's like beep, 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 tornado warning. So <laughs> you didn't take the laptop down with a pair of headphones down into the basement and just keep working? No, I've got pretty good insurance on this thing. So I was hoping the whole thing would have just got Toto and Dorothy and I'd be a rich man right now. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> blow the whole studio away. So are you staying entirely in the box at all times? Yes. I've been in the box since 2001 and I've done a few other podcasts and interviews and for the longest time, well, not the longest time, I did some research and thought I was the first engineer to mix a number one Billboard country single, radio, you know, 
100% in Pro Tools and bounce to disk, everything. Uh, and then I found out, uh, I got a call from a good friend of mine, Ed C., big engineer, did Martina McBride and whatnot. And he's like, hey, Decker, how you doing? I just heard a podcast where you said you were the first guy. Well, I got bad news. You were the second. <laughs> he beat me. He did a song uh, by Blake Shelton called Austin. And he beat me by, I think, a year. You know what I mean? So I was like, okay, I'll, I guess I'll be number two. So the other day I was uh, downtown visiting a friend in a studio and I saw him come out. And that, I mean, to this day, he goes, I said, hey, what's up, number one? He goes, not much, number two. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a friendly little camaraderie, you know, but he, he's a great guy. He's a good, great engineer. I hit my 16th number one. Oh, I think it was last year. Kid by the name of Dustin Lynch. The song was called Riding Roads. So, and I'm holding there right now. So we'll, we'll see if number 17's around the corner, you know. That's absolutely fantastic. Beats working. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a busy man. I mean, you're you're working all the time. You're you're, you're uh, mixed tastic. Turn. I mean, I, a lot of singles. I I assume a lot of singles. Yeah, and you know what? I because I mix. I, I started out in the demo world, right? That's where I cut my teeth. Uh, being in Nashville in the early late '90s, early 2000s. I mean, it was just. Songwriters would go in, block three hours, have a full band, come out with five tunes, sing them that afternoon, mix them that night, and then turn them into the publisher the next day so you could get a cut. And you couldn't be late, otherwise you'd miss the latest Garth Brooks or Joe Diffie or Reba cut, you know? So I had to do all of that. Never had an assistant. I was a one-man show. And I just was like tired of coming in every morning at 8 o'clock and working till 11 at night. My kids were growing up without a dad. My wife wasn't happy. And I was like, I've got to figure out some way. And that's when I figured out how to do this template mixing where I mix a song, do a save as, delete the audio, open up a new session with the audio, import session data, and it would pull the skin of the other session. It was like having an electronic, electronic assistant, you know, setting up all the patch bays and cables and stuff, EQing. And so I would just drop brand new audio into something I just mixed, hit play, and it was 85% done. And then I'd just go through, clean it up, boom. Uh, I told a funny story on the video, but I actually mixed, had to, because of a time constraint for a songwriter to retain his publishing deal. He was leaving for Christmas break. I had to mix 17 songs in one day. And I did it. Started at eight in the morning, finished at about seven. He came in and goes, okay, hit play. He'd listen to a verse and chorus. He goes, that sounds great. Print. Next one. Listen to it. I ah, turn the vocal up. Print. Boom. Done. We got out of there 11 at night. I went home. Felt like I had been at a ACDC concert in the front row. Just woo, woo, woo. But he actually got six of those cut on major label acts here in Nashville out of those 17 and obviously he kept his publishing deal and was happy as could be. So I don't tell many people that because they're like 17, really? Come on, dude. That's ridiculous, you know, but it was out of necessity. And I just learned to work that fast and efficiently. And finally I got to the point where I said, you know what? I really enjoy mixing. Uh, remember when mix magazine was the Bible and it wasn't just a little advertisement, little tiny thin paper anymore. It was like, that was the place. If you wanted to be in it, you know, all the big famous mixer guys were in it and stuff. And I was like, I want to do that. I want to be the guy with the fancy cars and the, the girls and the, the music and the big studio, you know, the, the rock stars of the engineering world. And they were all mix engineers. So I said, you know what? I'm a mixer. That's all I'm going to do anymore. And I had a friend who loved tracking, but could not stand mixing. And he goes, hey, let's do this. You tell everybody you're a mixer. I'll tell everybody I'm a tracking guy. You tell everybody you're, I'm the tracking guy. And I'll tell everybody you're the mixer. And we'll give each other all the extra work. And after about four or five months of that, in this town, everything pinballs off one another. It's all word of mouth, no business cards. Pretty soon, everybody's like, eh, go to Decker. You need it mixed. He's he's like the, the factory over there. He just cranks them out, you know, and he 
People are getting cuts. It's big, loud, wide. People love it. Well, keep going down the road. When it comes time for me to do a record, I still do the same thing just because I'm used to it. If I spend more than an hour on a mix, I'll screw it up. I really will. I'll start second guessing my gut and it'll just fall apart. So I've kept that speed. But what I like to tell everybody is I translate that back into giving the artist more time to come in and tweak the mix. And that's where they really get happy. Give the producer that time, the artist that time. They come in, do their song and dance. They're tickled pink, you know. They'd rather come in earlier than later, rather me going, oh, okay, I'll see you in 10 hours after I'm done mixing, you know. Be like, eh, give me an hour. I'll have you over here. Come on, you can get home for dinner still and have a good song, you know. Everything I have learned, I've learned from somebody else. So I almost feel like it's my duty to return that favor, you know. Um uh, and for two reasons, partially because people were nice enough for little old nobody Billy Decker to pick up a phone back in the day and call them and they would give me an answer or let me walk into the studio and ask. And partially, I like giving back because if I can get more people to mix like me and sound like me, I'd listen to the radio 24-7. It'd be an awesome world because everybody sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> Warren, I tell I tell everybody I'm the best medium dollar guy you'll ever have mix your music. <laughs> whenever, whenever anybody compliments me, I, I do exactly the same thing. If anybody ever gives me a compliment and says, oh, I really like what you did there, Eric hears me say it all the time. I'm always like, that's why I get the medium bucks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I think being self-effacing and, and as you're implying, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, you know. Sure, sure, sure. You know, we go back to like 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, all of those all of those guys and girls that were just kind of inventing what we do. By the time we got into it, you know. Eh. <laughs> I mean, I, I actually got to hang with Chris Ward Algae. I got to talk to Bob Clearmountain. I got to oh, oh, speak with Mike Shipley, and he gifted me some samples, believe it or not, before he passed, God rest his soul. And uh, so I've been very, very fortunate, you know? I've had the pleasure of being able to ask Joey Moy a question when he first came to Nashville, coming off the big Nickelback record when he was sure. co-producing with Mutt Lang. And I was having trouble with the, the bass, you know, where you'd be in the car, people hit a bass, and all of a sudden they'd hit one note that was a resonant frequency, and it goes, and your car doors blow out, and then it goes back here, and then it and I banged on the door and I was like, I, I, excuse me, Joey, I'm Billy Decker. I'm mixing right next door. Would you mind if I ask you a question? And he goes, no, come on in, come on in. So I showed him, I said, I've got this bass doing this, this, this. He's like, I know exactly how to fix that. I said, you do? He goes, yeah, you know how I know how to fix it? Because I had the same problem and Mutt Lang showed me how to fix it. How many times has Mutt Lang ever been wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I said, none. He goes, okay, sit down. This is how you fix it. And how do you fix it? Now I want to know. It was amazing. He he told me that Mutt was in love with math. Math and music go like this. So he goes, let's find out what note is doing that. We found out it, it was like a, a D, for instance. Okay, a low D. He pulls up on his computer, frequency of musical notes. Found the exact number that a D was, like 63 point two nine or something like that. It was a specific thing. It was a freak, a chart, you know, that had the actual number. So he would go in, take an EQ. He would dip at three dB, but he would make it at the narrowest bandwidth as possible. Right. And he would automate it every time on the grid. It would hit that note. It would automate that down and back. So by the time we got done the whole song, you had these little slices. If you zoomed out it, the whole song, but it leveled it out. It didn't change the tone. It didn't do anything. It took the resonant frequency out. And because he knew the exact number, there was no sweeping. It wasn't detracting from anything else. It was just dead on, you know? And he used a real sharp, sharp, I mean, we're talking like pencil sharp, you know? And he was like, Mutt showed me that math and music are like brother and sister. It just goes good together. And it just, I guess that's the way the world works, you know? It's all numbers yeah. if you do it, you know, it makes perfect sense. And then I had another guy uh, that I'm friends with and he worked with Mutt too. And 
one time I asked him something. And he said, oh, this is how you do it. And I said, well, how do you know? He goes, well, you know, Mutt showed me. And I said, well, how did Mutt know? And he goes, he just said it was, and he's Mutt, so there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, there you go. There you go. Absolutely. So it's fun, it's fun to give back. It really is. And I, I, I try to be an open book. I've spoke at some conferences and whatnot. And uh, I open myself. Everybody's like, oh, I don't want my number listed. I need to be unlisted. I'm like, I need my number listed. That's how I survive for people being able to get a hold of me. So I try to make my email, Facebook number everywhere in the book. You know, sure. I welcome people to ask me questions because I was so forthcoming with it. And so I literally will go home tonight and I'll probably have two messages on instant messenger going, Hey Decker. And by the way, nobody knows my first name is Billy. Everybody knows me as Decker. I don't even think, <laughs> I think my mom calls me Decker. You know, I, nobody even knows my first name. Hey Decker, Decker, Decker. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I mean, it takes 30 seconds for me to type a response to some little dude over in, uh, wherever Ireland or you name it, you know, South Africa, whatever. And you basically meet a friend for life, you know, and, and yeah. so it's great. It's great. You've done a course for us and you've mixed three songs. Yes, sir. And uh, tell us a little bit about the songs. What was the first one you mixed? Uh, the first one was I wanted to do every single genre as, as much as we could, you know. So we chose pop, country, and like a rock metal song. The first one is a current sounding pop song. Uh, I actually got permission to use it from my daughter. She's an aspiring artist. She's going to college for the music business down in Chattanooga. And uh, she writes with a bunch of people down here and has some publishers looking at her. The only problem is she's like, Dad, I can't stand country music. She's like, I hate country. I'm like, <laughs> you do know that I probably know somebody I could maybe call and help this process. She's like, nope, nope. I'm doing it on my own. I don't, I, I like pop music. I like singer songwriter. That's my thing. So anyway, she wrote and uh, a couple younger pop producers worked on this track with her. What His name's Cole Phillips. He's here in Nashville. Great millennial. You know, he's one of the, I, I tell everybody he's one of the two millennials I like. I can't stand the rest of my life, but there's two I like and they both work with me. No, I'm teasing. All of that was programmed, by the way. It was programmed top to bottom. You know what I mean? Not a not a real instrument on it. It was programmed other than the vocals. Uh, and then we jump over to country, which was a full on, everything was live, you know? Nothing programmed on it at all. Uh, that was a Texas country artist, good friend of mine, who actually also sells airplanes down there does great with airplanes and i called him up he's like oh yeah he's he tours around has a bus and everything down texas never even has to leave texas just tours around makes a mint selling it i mean like airplanes if you know what i mean like jets and uh so anyway he's like absolutely absolutely love for people to hear what i do and then uh the last one is a a female fronted rock band called relic and the lead singer lives over in the United Kingdom. The guitar player is here. They're like a, a duo. And uh, I got to actually co-produce that. So I had a pretty good handle on nice. how to do it. But I used the same template and the same approach for each one and showed that it's the main difference is the source material. You're always going to put an EQ on. You're always going to compress. You're always going to limit. But the source material really dictates how you're going to sound. And that's the strength in the, I guess, for lack of a better term, the beauty and the ease of working with these templates. You used the same template for all three songs. I did, yeah. I called them a different template I, just so they could be denoted and people could know, oh, we're doing pop now, we're doing country. But yeah, I go through and when you see it, you're like, oh, that's the same exact two bus he did. But pop, we loosened up the Kramer Pie compressor to two to one as opposed to three to one because three to one always pinches my pop too much, makes it smaller, doesn't resonate that lower, the 808s and all that type of stuff, the key bases and stuff. So we went two to one on that. On the metal song, we hit three to one and we laid that needle back a bit more than we normally do. The country one, we went three to one and we just barely, barely got it going. So it's kind of cool to be able to see how you're using the same exact stuff, but you're just driving into it maybe a little harder per the source material and changing just a few things. But 
boy, for the most part, you know. But you're also bussing before the master bus, so you're taking your drums and bussing. Correct. Taking, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We've got subgroups. We've got parallel compression. I can't wait to take this course. It's laid out just like you. You can't believe it, you know. I'm I'm going to use your template from now on. That's it. I hope you do. I hope you do. Like I said, then I'm going to listen to the radio every day because it's going to sound awesome. Sounds like me. So so wait there. So you've got a line of plugins. Joey Sturgis made them. JST. And he actually uh, came and uh, he and I became friends. And uh, he sat in on a session when he was down visiting or something. And actually was like, you know what? You and I are almost identical the way we mix. It's just, I do metal and you do country. But he's like, I've never really, he's known for metal. And he goes, I've never really dove into country. And I think it would be really cool to give you your own line of plugins. So we mimicked each of my channels. Do you use those plugins on this mix or are you using? Oh yes, yeah. Okay, good. I'm, I'm probably, I'm not one of the few, but I actually buy almost every plugin I've got. I mean, at this point, I can get stuff for free, but I always love endorsing something that I can put my mouth and money towards, you know? Sure. So uh, I use my plugins religiously because they're very efficient with the DSP. So like my electric plugin has an API EQ model, a clip clipper, JST clipper, and then a limiter, like an L2 style, you know? But... The, my plugin has a fixed EQ curve because you can't change the EQ. So if I put it on, it sounds great. That's awesome. I'll use mine. It's way more DSP efficient and it's more modern and stuff like that, easier to use. Uh, but if it needs to be brightened up or something like that or doled out or it needs a little tweaking, I'll have to go back to my original signal chain to really get in and surgically dial it. If need be, I can just put possibly that API in front of my plugin and brighten it up just a bit. And then we're there, you know? So you'll see me do that where I actually used my plugin and I was like, no, nah, this doesn't sound as good. It doesn't work for this song. So I took it off. I lost $4 and 22 cents. You know what I'm saying? I just, I lost a sale. I, I just killed my own career. I told people not to buy my stuff. <laughs> So what have what you, what you been working on at the moment? What are you, uh, outside of what you're, we're doing together, what, uh, what have you been mixing? Uh, let's see. I just finished up a fella on uh, Sony. His name's Andrew Janakis. He was on The Voice, didn't win, but he became uh, one of those viral TikTok stars, you know, and Fantastic. got signed to a record deal, and his first single's out right now. Uh, I came out about a month ago, I think. It's called Gone Too Soon. And that's out. I just finished up some more Rodney Atkins stuff. Uh, he's got a new duo with his wife called Rodney and Rose that's really cool. And that comes out real soon. I did a new Eddie Montgomery single. I did uh, Colt Ford. They're both on Average Joe's Entertainment. I did some Canadian stuff. There's a band up there called The Road Hammers. My day and my schedule, I kid you not, Warren, I'm not one of those guys that you call and say, hey, Billy, can we have you mix something? Can you book February 22nd through the 20th? No, I'm just like, no, 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 just call me, you know? I tell everybody because all I do is mix. I'm 100% in the box. I can start and stop and you never will miss a pitch. I tell everybody I'm 24 hours from starting your song. And that's because I'm also very efficient, very quick, you know? So my day is, I couldn't even tell you what I'm doing for the rest of the week. I haven't looked at my computer yet, but I kid you not, five days a week, all I do is get up and I either have Dropbox, we transfers or something. And I mean, there's exceptions to the rule, but for the most part, every I've been around so long, everybody knows me, I've got my niche, you know, and people just, they don't even ask anymore. They just say, Decker, I got two, go. Do you have an assistant or do you just... just I don't, I don't, I've never had an assistant. I tried and the bad thing with that is I found myself talking to him or her more than I was mixing and I kept getting distracted, you know? So I do have uh, a couple, those two favorite millennials I was telling you about. And uh, they we kind of have a deal where I'll let them use the studio and they'll come in and bounce down my versions, do the stems, 
for the label delivery and stuff like that, you know? But yeah, it works out great. It works out great. They're, they're super happy because they have a place to work at. And I never work weekends. And I hardly ever work past six or seven at night for the most part, you know? That's what I was going to ask. What time are you starting in the morning? I usually start, uh, well, I used to be the guy in, I would drop, get up 6.30, drop the kids off to school, get in, mix as fast as I could and try to get home for dinner and play with the kids before it got dark, you know, especially in the summer. Uh, so I used to be a very early riser. And the cool thing is Music Row, Nashville doesn't even start till 10 o'clock. So I would get in 8, 8, 15, 8, 30. I could have a couple done before, during quiet time. You know, nobody was bothering me. The phone wasn't ringing, stuff like that. Now my kids are grown and gone, empty and empty nesters. I purposely avoid rush hour traffic because Nashville's gotten horrible, you know. I mean, it's not as bad as LA yet, but- I was about to say, you're right. I, I, I go to Nashville fairly frequently and your idea of horrible is our <laughs> idea of like, what a beautiful- Hardly any traffic on the road, yeah. <laughs> now, see, to me, that's bad here, but yeah, no, I- I, no, I know, I know, I'm just teasing. I, I would waste an hour, no kidding, sitting on the interstate. So I purposely avoid it, and I try to come in 10, 30, 11, and then I'm usually, I work past rush hour on the way out, which usually goes till 6, 30 or 7, so I'm usually home 7, 7, 30. So I still work the same amount of time. I just shifted the time I come in to the time I go home, you know? And that way I can get home, watch Netflix, eat dinner and drink an IPA or, you know, whatever. Well, we're gonna we're gonna put a link to your book as well. Link to the course, link to the book, you name it. The, the whole schnizzle. Well, I was honored to have you ask me to be on. It's fantastic. So no, I'm, it's I'm great. a big fan. I'm a big fan. I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of yours and I'm very excited for this course because I'm going to steal from it. I really am. And I do I do use templates because I mix in two different ways. You know, I mix either entirely in the box, increasingly, or through the console. And the console tends to stay pretty stagnant. You know, gear tends so to... So it is a template. Away. It is a yeah, template. So it becomes it's, a template. It is your template, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I learned that from watching all of the guys we were talking about earlier that just literally are just doing fader rides. Um but there's something about, let's be honest. I mean, you just talked about, you know, the, what you were talking about with Mutt, finding that specific frequency. That only really works in the digital world because in the digital world, you can type in the exact frequency and pull out the exact cue so fine. You know, it's, yeah. So it, it's, it's one of those things that, um, you know, I love being able to work hybrid. So I do all the fine stuff in the digital world, and then sure. all the big kind of glossy, add some air, get some low end, use the SSL bus compression. So do uh, broad strokes. Like it. So what do you use on your bus? Talking of that, and what do you use on your master bus? I use an EQ, a Sonex EQ. The V. I use a VST plugin for that. Yep. I use it to high pass, low pass. I add just a little brightness, maybe a dB or two at 8K, and then I go down. Uh, I talk in the course, most EQs have detents and they're preset like 60 Hertz, 125. So I always try to, now that we can get in with these digital models, I always try to go just a few numbers below or above. So I sound a little different. So instead of 60, I'll do 58 or 62 or 63 and a half, you know, just kind of dance around there just so it, hopefully it sounds a little bit different. Uh, but then I throw a Kramer Pie on, and that's got a fixed attack. And then uh, I use the as fastest release possible, 100 milliseconds. Uh, then I go with the Oxford, Sony Oxford Inflator. And I don't know what it does. It just does. And it's magic, yeah. Yeah, I, I have no idea. And then I usually, uh, if I really want to go crazy, I'll put a clipper in between that and then the isotope, ozone. Maximizer. I use that and I use ISRC2 nine times out of 10. Uh, and I just knock it back a few lights, you know, and make sure it's true peak limiting, all that stuff. Turn on the transients by 50%. But you can actually get stuff ridiculously loud if you put that clipper in between that and the, it's an old metal trick where these guys are mastering themselves, you know? And I mean, yeah, it, yeah. it just, it, 
it it tears your head off. It's crazy. No, it's great. Well, we've had we've we've had many many long conversations with people about you know about what what people consider top down mixing, and what I keep telling them, and hopefully you can uh, hopefully you can back me up on this is. What you're using on a mix bus is there because everything you're doing beforehand is controlled. One of the things that scares me is with the top-down mixing being taught is they'll start off with your master bus like that and then just kind of mix into it. And what they don't realize is like you've controlled like bussing drums together, using parallel like you were talking about earlier. All this stuff is going on. And then this mix bus is just tap, 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 tap. But starting fresh, it mixing into it is just foolish, obviously, because it will just, you know, you'll just end up like ozone will just turn down, oh, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I usually loosen up, I leave everything pretty much as is on that master bus and I'll loosen up the ozone. And then I'll just, once I get where I'm close, I'll tighten up the ozone and it always just takes that vocal and pushes it a little bit forward and it's like, we're done. So, and then I'll, I'll if I need to send to a mastering house, I'll loosen up that to zero, take off the ozone, you know, and then uh, if they want a Decker master just to save money, you know, I just print it at 16441 and say Matt Decker mastered for upload to Spotify, you know, and a lot of times I'll be honest, I've got a lot of mastering engineers that are my friends and they've kind of showed me what they've done and I don't claim to be a mastering engineer, but they taught me enough where I can offer that service to my clients, you know? So if they can't afford to go to an outside mastering facility, I provide them with one and it's just added value, you know? And they're like, thanks, dude. Appreciate it. You saved me a couple hundred bucks or whatever, you know? Yeah. No, I, I hear you. We have a thing called Spitfire Master named after the studio. And so sometimes on our mixes, you'll see SFM, Spitfire Master. And it's it's similar kind of process where I'm 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 using compression, EQ, a little bit of clipping, and then some limiting on the end, and it gets loud. Um, but I do it because probably precisely the reason you do is you know your people are listening to your mixes alongside professionally mastered, already released things, judging your mix on it. So I just got used to having to do that. Yeah, yeah, and especially when you're mixing demos, you never want to be quieter than the song before you or the yeah. the one after you yeah. louder because then you just loudness really does fool people. Louder is better, you know. Yeah. So I spoke at a conference and I had these kids send me some uh, glasses with inscriptions on them, like a glass set to drink out of. One of them said, "Kick drums sell records." One of them said, "Louder is better." And then the last one said, we're not trying to put a man on the moon. We're just trying to get him on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> and those were all my saying, my isms that I spoke at this conference. And I'm like, oh, that's too cool. So talking about that, about getting too esoteric, when you're mixing, you know, what is it you're looking for? Is it, is it essentially excitement? Is it just like whatever you mix, whether it's pop, country, metal, like these three songs that you've just created this course for, are they... Is it all about like, it jumps out of the speakers, it's exciting, it's got depth, it's got width. I mean, is, am I hitting catchphrases that sort of you're listening for? Yeah, it just, it, it's weird. To me, I've all, I grew up on all that stuff that was like larger than life. You know, the Def Leppards, the Brian Adams, uh, all the super, super hypey stuff. You know, I always just gravitated towards that. So... That's what I try to do. I just try to make something larger than life and make it make it sound like when I was growing up, going into a recording studio was kind of like the Wizard of Oz behind that green curtain. You had no idea what was going on. People would go into the studio, they'd come out months later and it'd be like, oh my gosh, how did they do that? There's like fairy dust and magic and elves and all that, you know? How do they do that? And so I try to recreate that every time I do something. Now, whether or not I get there or not, I don't know, but I try. And that's like when I EQ, I always equate a little bit brighter than normal as excitement. You know, I always try to make stuff just kind of a little shimmery, shimmerier, if that's a word or whatnot, you know, and just kind of like exciting to listen to. That's, that's, that's a good way to put it, you know? 
do you do any other tests? Do you get out of your environment? Do you go and sit in your car ever? Do you put on a pair of headphones and checks? Do you do you do the trick of playing the music and then walking out of the room and listening? Is there any kind of little things, especially if you're a little unsure, is there anything you do? There is. I actually, every time I mix, I pipe everything through that 1999 boom box with line ins. Wow. And it still has a cassette player in it. You know what I'm saying? It's that old. Yeah, yeah. And if it sounds good on that, it tells me that the vocal is the right level and the brightness is dead on. So I always pipe it through the boom box. Uh, I always listen to everything on the drive home. Even after a long day of mixing, I still am so used to my car stereo that I will listen to it. And I recently got a different vehicle about four years ago and I bought it for the stereo. And the reason I had to buy it is because my old stereo in my car, I had it for so long, the drivers were rotted out and they were clunking against the thing. So here I am supposed to be an audio engineer mixing stuff for the radio. And I got a blown speaker in the back of my car that I'm referencing people's mixes on. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, now we better get a new a new system and, and patch that up. So, but I got so used to it that I knew if it was bass heavy, bass light, even with a blown torn woofer, I still knew the way it sounded. You know? I've got a friend who is constantly changing speakers. He chases the latest greatest thing, and I'm like, how do you do that? I mean, I've sat here and I can do this, and. You may not like my mix, but you know it's going to be consistent. You may not like what I do, but it's like you're guaranteed a decent product. And that's because I know this like the back of my hand, this room. I've been in this room for eight years now, you know, and before that I was 17 and I've got the same gear I was using in the other room. So if I had to change monitors and, and setups all, I, I'd be lost. I really would. So... Amazing. I think you can mix on anything as long as you know it, you know? I know Great. everybody used to mix on NS10s, and some people still do. The only thing an NS10, for me, it's good for is to prop open that studio door right over there. <laughs> That's it. Other than that, throw those in the dumpster. Those things are horrible. And yet, there's been millions of great records made on those. I couldn't do it. You know? Clear Mountain, yeah? Yes, yes. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they do it. So Yeah, I no, I, I hear you. I, I remember working with uh Andy Fernback, one of the first times I worked with like, you know, at my sure. studio, like a real guy. You know, he was Pink Floyd's producer and engineer, and I was all like really intimidated. And he came in and I had a pair of like JBLs and NS tens. And I think he said, every time I walk into a studio, I see a pair of NS tens, I want to throw them out the window. I remember being like I thought they were the things you were supposed to have, you know. <laughs> well, this has been absolutely fantastic. Well, good. I had fun. This has been a great day. So, great. Well, I I look forward to the course because I'm going to I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it. Uh. <laughs> we, we we'll do a little uh, Billy Decker's template in action. There you go. I'd love to see that. So, somebody actually once said, "Dude, are you seriously you I mean, in the template, I give the exact settings that I do. There is nothing hidden. And you know what was funny is before I decided to do the book and give away the secret of the ghost or whatever you call it, give up the ghost, you know? And seriously, dial by dial, it's there. It's me. It's everything. You follow that, you plug in audio, it sounds like me. Right. And I took, I said, before I decide to put myself out of business, you know, for good, I'm going to test this theory. So I gave to three of my good mixing buddies here in town, the exact same song, all the same stems, my exact template, all my samples, everything. I said, do me a favor, mix this, try to copy me. You know what happened? I got back three different mixes. You know why? Didn't even sound like me. It's because I start down the mixing path. All of a sudden we get to the snare drum. I start taking a right turn because I love the, the top crack. My buddy's like, no, I want more meat. So he goes off left. Pretty soon, you're so off thing and everything multiplies and multiplies. And you know why? 
It's because right here, everybody has their own ear and they're always, no matter what you do, you're always going to gravitate towards what you like. I've, I would like to think I'm pretty knowledgeable about mixing and I've tried to copy other people before and it's virtually impossible. I can get kind of close, but the same thing happens. I steer towards something that works for me. You know, I, I fall back on old tricks and tools and stuff like that. So after getting those three separate mixes back, I'm like, release the hounds. Let's go. Give it to them. It's all good. Yep. I agree. We, we all hear differently. We do. We do. And there's lots of reasons for that. I mean, even just biology. It, everybody's penae, this part of the ear is different. So different frequencies appear louder or quieter to us. And remember, I, I have the strength of 10 men and x-ray vision, and I know how to slow down the speed of sound in a cold room so I can hear better than most people. <laughs> and it's all through the AC. Everybody all of a sudden is clicking off on the course. Okay, we've had enough of him. Done. Click. <laughs> so, Billy, let's do a live stream where we critique people's mixes, people that mix these songs from your course. Absolutely. I am in 100%. All right. So those of you that do the course, you can submit the mixes and Billy will pick, I don't know, just pick 10 at random and mix there critique you go. them. Perfect. Billy, thank you ever so much. You rock. Thank you, Warren. I consider myself to be decorated. I love it. I've been hewerted. That's a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> we will see you soon, old friend. Enjoy the course, everybody. Thanks ever so much. Please leave any comments and questions below. Mm -hmm.